Hey there folks, welcome to Spectrum Pulse. We talk about music, movies, art, and culture. And today, it's a big one. We're going to be talking about the newest album from Deaf Heaven called Ordinary Corrupt Human Love. So I remember where I was when I covered New Bermuda. And when I say that, I'm referring to my position with respect to black metal. Because sure, I had done some of my research to familiarize myself with the trends in the genre, but I still felt very much like I was on the outside looking in. The hipster music critic using a band like Deaf Heaven for his inroads into the larger genre, but getting scared off when it got too real. And yet, that didn't really happen for me. And while I still wish I could find more black metal albums to cover here on my channel, request them on Patreon, I'd be happy to review them, but I would freely admit my personal preferences within the genre have deepened and matured over the past couple of years. Not to the point where I will outright dismiss the success that Death Heaven has found in taking an atmospheric black metal sound to a larger audience, but to me they've never really risen past being just a gateway act to bring people into the genre. In fact, I'll be blunt, outside of maybe the occasional cut from Sunbather, I haven't really revisited Death Heaven in a long time, and I certainly would not put them up against stronger material from the black metal that's made my year-end list the past three years. But on a similar note, I'm not really about to dismiss Death Heaven either. Yeah, frontman George Clark, he's not endeared himself to me whatsoever in some of his comments off the mic, but ultimately it's about the music. And at their best, Death Heaven can tap into the soaring crescendos and high points of melody that drew me to atmospheric black metal in the first place. And where New Bermuda kind of stumbled was trying to simultaneously double down on the heaviness and then the brighter rock segments where the clash felt kind of discordant and it didn't all together flow together. So when I heard that Ordinary Corrupt Human Love was heading back in the direction of Sunbather to re-embrace some of the prettier atmospherics, I was actually kind of looking forward to how this could turn out, especially given all the critical acclaim. And as the band could get pretty intriguing on a lyrical level as well, and yes, I still care about that. So, alright, what do we get from Ordinary Corrupt Human Love? Well, honestly, the more listens I gave this album, the more I found myself a little bit baffled by Death Heaven's pivot, because in any other genre, I would call this a more commercial album, but Death Heaven make black metal, or at least I thought they did before this. No, Ordinary Corrupt Human Love falls into a bit of a weird space for me. Because on the one hand, the band is definitely doubling down on their melodic core, easily making this their most accessible album to date. But on the other hand, I keep feeling like I should like this a fair bit more than I do, and I can't but feel that something's missing in the formula that made Sunbather work five years ago. In other words, Ordinary Corrupt Human Love, it's not a bad project. In fact, I think it's pretty good, but it's definitely not great, and nailing down why is tricky. And make no mistake, this album is definitely going back to the territory of Sunbather. Nowhere close to as heavy as New Bermuda, and with the most explicit callback being the intro of Honeycomb, where the tone and progression is transposed down from Please Remember. But even then, what made Sunbather click so well for me were the passages and the progressions, the soaring crescendos, the explosive climaxes, where the thunderous intensity of black metal proved that foundation for stunning melody. But here... The progressions don't seem anywhere near as pronounced or dramatic, likely a facet of Death Heaven landing on admittedly really good melodic motifs fairly early within the piece, and then proceeding them to hammer them as hard as they possibly can throughout the entire song, without the same development or progression in the melody you would typically see in this brand of black metal. And that's before you get the pieces that are the most blatant steps into post-rock, or damn near a shimmering tone in indie rock that Death Heaven have ever approached. Yes, at the end of the day, this record will wrench itself back towards the thunderous black beats and the tremolo picking and the tones that are a little bit more somber around the edges and it's not like George Clark has stopped screaming midway to the back of the mix so you can barely make out what he's saying but more than ever these flirtations with more sedate Brit pop progressions they feel like more of a seamless feature of Death Heaven's overall sound than more of a diversion like they were on New Bermuda and you know I gotta admit I'm kind of torn on them overall yeah they're pretty enough and they certainly hit that blissful twinkling note effectively, even with the slightly more melancholic trappings of Nier and the Chelsea Wolf collaboration Night People, but I'm also kind of left thinking that some of these quieter segments, they should have way more restrained poignance to really connect with me than they do. A big part of this is some of the clean vocals. I get why George Clark has placed midway to the back because the overdub clean singing, like on the outro of Canary Yellow, it 
It's got nowhere close to the stately presence and grandeur that it thinks it does. And when you follow up with Near, it's a breathing moment that's not really needed for this album. Most because the quieter moments, they don't have their own distinctive melodic progressions for contrast in comparison with the heavier black metal pieces. And look, I'm a huge fan of Chelsea Wolfe, and she sounds really good on Night People just in terms of pure singing, but she doesn't really have a lot to work with here. And considering the lyrical content of the song, it feels like it's missing a sense of climax or any sense of grit or edge to match the environment that she typically thrives, especially coming off of his spun. But really, if I'm looking through the instrumentation for the passages that move me the most, they probably lie in Carrie McCoy's lead guitar passages and the solos that shift off of the tremolo riffing and raise the melody to new heights, like across You Without End or Worthless Animal, and especially Honeycomb, both before and after that quieter transition piece in the middle. And that's kind of the weird thing. When this album sticks with the huge, shimmering walls of atmospheric black metal, we get genuinely beautiful moments, with Chris Johnson stepping up as the new bassist and Daniel Tracy being consistently excellent on the drums. But where you'd think they would do well in the more atmospheric or the prettier post-rock or indie rock passages, they're just not as impressive for me. Maybe they could afford to be a little bit more spare and restrained. As I really like the ambient outdoor sounds that bookend the album, maybe it's just that added bit of untamed wildness that they really need to drive this all home and really bring it together. But of course, the other big part of this conversation is the lyrics and the reason why, while I'm not exactly surprised nor entirely pleased with the results, I do get why this album went in a brighter direction. Because for the most part, these are love songs. And when I say that, I'm not talking about traditional romanticism so much as our protagonist on this album confronting the elemental emotions of love with a certain amount of skepticism, suspicion, uncertainty, and something damn near close to fear. Keep in mind that the majority of the emotions coming off of New Bermuda, they were a cavalcade of nihilistic, self-destructive what-now statements in the face of some real success that they had found that they didn't expect. So you can tell that dealing with the sheer positive ecstasy of love and romantic attraction is really throwing him for a loop. And I'll say it, it's kind of a natural fit for Deaf Heaven's sweeter melodies and poetry. Now, I'll admit part of this is pretty niche. The downcast, sinister, black metal nihilist finding his heart caught in his throat on Honeycomb, and then leaning into the primal embrace on Canary Yellow, it can be genuinely moving if you're kind of in that demographic, but the fact that these moments occur so early, and given the band that we're dealing with, it's not gonna last. The second half of Glint gets clingy to the point of body horror, and by the time we get to Night People, the female counterpart very much becomes a downcast, shrinking alabaster vessel from where ecstasy might have initially been found, but will drain away slowly with that purity. And this is where the title of this album snaps into relief and we get an uglier side, because any love found will eventually be recast as animalistic lust that our protagonist must put out of its misery in order to protect a purity that he will never properly attain. And if you're familiar with the subtext and the coding and some of Deaf Heaven's leanings in the past toward NSBM, this could get a whole lot more uncomfortable, but really that's conjecture that a larger portion of the audience won't really care about, I'll admit that. And the larger issue for me comes in the themes. The protagonist has a chance to experience the emotional transcendence of genuine love, which could show a major change for his character, and yet by the end it's all diminished to put him back in the same ruthless and nihilistic position from whence he started, which only further undercuts all those transcendent moments if all you're going to get back is to the very beginning and not really advance, and having killed a dog on the final song. Yikes. So in the end, okay look, it's a step back in the right direction, but it feels oddly compromised to me and not in a good way. The Death Heaven has settled into a comfort zone that shows them not really taking the experimental step they really could, which might be the reason why I'm kind of underwhelmed by the post-rock passages they do try. I just keep thinking that they could do more in this direction and they don't really go there. And we tack on romantic framing around some genuinely unsettling NSBM, preserve the purity of white women text and subtext and sadly it's not just around Worthless Animal, the more I go back through the album it crops up a fair bit. But it's harder for me to recommend, especially when it doesn't really help the overall thematic arc of the album as a whole. Ugh. Okay, this is a punch-in segment. This is something that I actually haven't done before when it comes to a review, an entirely unscripted piece that, when I was tweeting about something randomly about some of the NSBM themes and coding that I observed surrounding this record, some people actually pointed out some interviews to me that showed that 
yeah, I was uh, completely off. That's a little bit of the infuriating piece when it comes to this level of critical explanation when it comes to black metal, because you're used to some of those themes and coding being present in the work. And thus, when you take a look at what what Deck Heaven is actually looking to focus on, no, they're looking at observing the wonders of the natural world and finding the glory and the subtle beauty in the little things and the mundanity of it all. So it's a lot more upward looking, at least on some of the most openly facing tracks. And yeah, Worthless Animal, apparently that's an allegory to somebody who is abusing the homeless. And then basically our front man, George Clark, guts him like a fish for doing so. I have questions surrounding how much I buy that interpretation because it doesn't really fit in with the first half of the entire goddamn song. It's a really odd kind of patronizing view of the homeless to paint them as such the innocent fawn characters because it kind of doesn't obscure the complicated realities of the situation and that doesn't also ascribe to the majority of the coding that runs through the entire album but yeah if this is my fault being able to look at something and say yeah there might be elements that might tie into nsbm coding when it comes to the language and when it comes to a lot of the presentation that might be on me so if i got that wrong fine but at the same time it also doesn't really impact the overall through line and the more I hear that explanation the less it kind of makes sense with the subtext that's actually already evidenced within the songs the majority of these are still love songs they're still very much presented like that and there still is very much a downwards decreasing nihilistic arc by the end of it especially when you get to the last couple songs especially when you get to night people and worthless animal even when viewed as allegorical the way that George Clark describes it it's still is not the sort of climax that makes sense and actually pays off the arc. It feels increasingly disconnected. Then again, that's also indicative of the album's flow as a whole. It does feel increasingly disconnected. It doesn't flow into each other, and that's another factor that I might as well consider, but... Ugh. Okay, so the lesson here to be totally taken, do your research, kids, before you actually give out a score. I'm standing by my score because I'm ultimately still not as much of a fan of this instrumentally as I wanted to be. The lyrics is added subtext that I wasn't sure I could get on board with. But now apparently my original conclusion surrounding that subtext was wrong, so yeah, take it as you will. Enjoy if you want. But on the other other hand, most black metal fans couldn't give two shits about the lyrics, they're just here for the melodies, and those melodies are really damn strong, so on that basis I'm giving it a 7 out of 10, but I can't really recommend it in good conscience. It's black metal, it's pretty niche anyway, anybody who really cares about it will have heard it already. It's better than New Bermuda, it's not better than Sunbather, it probably deserves to be a little bit less critically beloved when you dig into the lyrics, but if you're curious, well... Now you know what's there. So yeah, thanks a lot for watching. If you'd like to like and subscribe, I'd be more than grateful. Beyond that, though, if you want to buy the record, link's down there below. And I got the poll up there. I'm curious where you guys fall in it. I know it's getting a ton of critical acclaim, but I'm just not there in the same way. There's better black metal. Beyond that, if you guys if you want to actually support this channel or help talk about what's going to impact my schedule, link to my Patreon is right over there. Or three times a week you guys get to vote on my schedule. And once a week for the higher tier contributors, you guys get to add albums, movies, or even a top 10 list to that schedule. More details right there. You want to see what's on my schedule, it's on my Instagram, link down there below. Anything else I might be able to do to improve my presentation, I'm all ears. But until then, I'm Mark, you're watching Spectrum Pulse, and I'll see you next time.